All right, everybody, so let's, uh, let's get started. Um, I want to continue our discussion regarding uh, structural design um, and get into loads and how loads are distributed and kind of tie together some of the stuff you all learned um, last semester. Um, <coughs> so first off, let me, uh, let me get the sign-in sheet started around. So let me sort of recap where we left off last time and where we're headed. So last time we talked about you know, larger impact issues, you know, what is your job as a structural engineer? What is your role in a project? How do you fit in? And what are your responsibilities? Um, and just, you know, that overall aspect. And then we got into, well, we know that your job is to design, but how exactly do you do that? Um, <laughs> and we ultimately uh, came down to, to two primary theories. Now, one of them, Allowable strength design makes sense right off the bat. It's simple. It's straightforward. Um, it has a little bit of a, an issue, though, when you start thinking about things like uniform levels of safety and, and ensuring uh, proper risk management or, or uniform risk management, I could say. Um, that's where you start to have a little bit of an issue. But let's go back and make sure that we understand uh, what's going on with these two philosophies. So allowable strength design is just your fundamental factor safety, uh, uh, simplistic way of design, I would put it. So you've got a member, you take it on down to the lab and you uh, load it until failure, and let's say it fails at 100 kips. So that's its nominal capacity. Uh, in other words, you know, that's what will cause it to fail under that given limit. And you go, well, I want to apply a factor of safety to that. Let's say a factor of safety of two. So instead of uh, using 100 kips for the purpose of design, I am only going to use 50 kips for the purpose of design. So I have ensured that I'm using a, a factor of safety of two. It sounds pretty straightforward, sounds pretty simple, right? There are problems associated with that. The, uh, one of the big ones is that it doesn't take into account uncertainty. Like, uh, and when I say uncertainty, what I really mean is managing risk, okay? There is no you know, there, there, there's no way to design a perfectly safe structure. If you think about things in terms of probability and statistics, there's always some probability that a structure will fail. It's all about managing that probability of failure. Now, I, I say, you know, thinking about things from a probability and statistics standpoint because there are uncertainties associated with structural engineering. Now, if we look at things from two sides of the, uh, the equation, start talking about, let's say, resistances, there's always levels of uncertainty with resistance. Remember, I take this down to the lab, I put it under a frame, and I load it until failure, and it fails at, let's say, 700 pounds. The next table, uh, is it going to fail at exactly 700 pounds? Maybe this one's 698. Maybe this one's 692. Maybe this one's 711. Maybe this one's 684, you know? There's some scatter. Maybe they're all centralized around 700 pounds, but there's some scatter associated with that. There's some uncertainty with things like material quality, fabrication tolerances, just the level of construction. They're going to be built a little differently. What about the loads? I mean, shouldn't there be a fair amount of uncertainty associated with the loads? I mean, we can take a wild guess about uh, how many uh, pounds per square foot are going to be loaded in a given classroom at Marshall University, but there, it's a guess. I mean, it might be an educated guess, but ultimately that is what it is. There is some uncertainty associated with it. <laughs> so because of that, I want to look at an, a, a way of assessing that uncertainty, okay? And I do that through the use of what are called reliability-based methods. Now that's just, again, a fancy way of saying risk management. I'm trying to manage my acceptable levels of risk in structural design. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you all have had at least some exposure to probability and statistics at some point during your education. So you've probably heard of a bell curve before, a normal distribution. You've probably heard those terms before, right? But what you're looking at are normal distributions. I'm just assuming for the sake of discussion that I'm dealing with normal distributions. I could deal with all sorts of different types of distributions, but for now, a normal distribution I think is good enough for discussion purposes. Now, <clears throat> I'm looking at two distributions, one for assessing 
the resistance of a given structure and one for assessing the loads that are on that structure. Now, first thing I notice is that, see how the resistance curve is to the right of the loads curve? Well, that, that better be the case. Because what I'm saying is, on average, the resistance is larger than the loads. And that better be the case, right? If it was the other way around and I was designing a bridge, that would mean that grandma is falling in the river and I don't want anything to happen to grandma, right? Makes sense, right? Now, another thing that's a little more subtle to notice about these curves, notice how the resistance curve is a little skinnier, a little taller. Notice that? Well, if you remember, if we go back to, let's say, the, the table example, and I start you know, failing all the tables in this room. Well, yeah, I can take the average of that data, but there's more to it, right? Remember that whole standard deviation? Remember that? would make sense that the standard deviation for something like resistance be smaller than for something like loads. Because standard deviation, if you remember, that's a measure of how dispersed your data is. That's how scattered your data is, right? We as engineers should have a lot more control over the resistance than we do the loads. I mean, we're the ones designing the structures, but once the structures are out there, we don't have as much control over how much they're being loaded, right? So it makes sense just from a conceptual standpoint that the resistance has a smaller standard deviation. Everybody all right with that? Everybody good? Okay. Now, this is a resistance curve. This is a load curve. What I'm going to do is calculate a third one resistance minus the loads. That gives me a curve that looks something like that. I called it a Z for system function. It doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want. But in the end, I'm looking at a curve that represents the resistance minus the loads. Now, <laughs> by its very nature, look at it. You've got some of that curve that's trailing on over on the other side of the y-axis. So here's my y-axis. Most of these values are positive, but I've got some of them that are negative. Right? What does that mean? Okay, look at the equation, R minus Q, the resistance minus the loads. So if I calculate resistance minus the loads, I get a positive number. What does that mean? That means the resistance is bigger, right? Isn't that what we want? We want the resistance to be bigger than the loads. So anything on that side of the y-axis indicates that the structure is safe, right? Anything that's on the other side of the axis, on the left side, are negative values, where the loads are bigger. We don't want the loads to be bigger. But from a probabilistic standpoint, there's always the chance that they could be. Okay? Keep in mind, bell curves here are normal distributions. They go from infinity to in negative infinity to infinity. They go on forever. So when you look at things from that standpoint, there's always some level of risk associated with design. There's always some probability of failure. We define probability of failure as this shaded region right here. All the area under the negative portion of the curve. Because all that area there represents the scenarios where the structure is unsafe. So what we're trying to do in structural design is, is not um, eliminate the possibility of failure altogether because we know that's impossible. But what we can do is manage that level of failure to acceptable means. And, and that's what we do in design, because there's, there's just no way to completely eliminate it. <laughs> now, the way that we manage this failure is through um, what we'll call a reliability index. Now, again, I don't expect you all to uh, be able to demonstrate this math uh, or, or these mathematical concepts. I just want you to understand the ideas. Okay? Now, a reliability index, or this term beta, is essentially just a measure of how many standard deviations we are away from the y-axis are we? One standard deviation away, two standard deviations away, three standard deviations away, what have you. Okay? So the higher beta is, the, say, or the, 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 the more stringent our uh, requirements on risk are. Okay? So to give you kind of an idea, and this is probably a little more related to uh, steel design, so, um, you know, let me put it like this. It'll be easier to describe how we manage uh, risk in, in beams when we start really getting into that. Um, when we start looking at uh, resistance factors, we have different resistance factors in concrete design 
depending upon the behavior of a bean, to, to, to give you kind of an idea. So um, ultimately, we will learn about these uh, phi values that adjust the, the resistance of a beam. And what we find is, is that if a beam is controlled by its tensile behavior, we tend to have higher resistance factors than, than if it is controlled by its compressive behavior. And the reason for that is in, in reinforced concrete design, and, and it's one of the, just those parameters about concrete, uh, and, and particularly about reinforced concrete, we tend to place reinforcement in a beam anywhere that there's some uh, element of tension in a beam. Concrete is a material that doesn't like tension very much. So that's where we put the reinforcement. Now, because of that, when you load a reinforced concrete beam, if it's tension controlled, what happens is the steel beam or the steel rebar tends to yield and then the beam just kind of softens and stops carrying load. That's what a reinforced uh, concrete beam does if it's tension controlled, if it's controlled by the behavior of the, the rebar. If it's compression controlled, what happens is you start loading the beam and it's the concrete that's failing first. And when concrete fails in compression, it goes boom. And that beam suddenly fails very quickly. So we adjust that capacity more stringently. And the, you know, the rationale not only is from a level of safety standpoint, but it's all hinged on, on beta. Now, a little bit more of a, a, a direct and straightforward example actually comes from steel design. When we design just members in a steel frame, they tend to be designed based on a beta value of about three. But when we design connections, they're designed based off of a beta of around four. Because if a connection fails, you've got multiple members framing in. So you've got more of a stringent requirement on beta then than you would just for an individual member. Yeah, it sucks if a member fails, but if a connection fails, it's pretty bad. Everybody good? OK. <clears throat> this is just for your own edification. This is how you would calculate beta if you were looking at uh, two normal distributions. I I'm not worried or concerned that you're able to compute that. It's more just from a conceptual standpoint. What I am more invested in that you're, you have the ability to do or to understand is this. Now, I am cheating a little bit because this does not come from the, uh, the, uh, 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 an assessment of building specifications. It comes from an assessment of bridge specifications. But structures are structures. They, they, you know, a beam is a beam. Doesn't matter where it's at. <laughs> what you're looking at is a comparison of how bridges perform before and after the adoption of LRFD. Okay? So on the left, let's take the, uh, the curve on the left first. And let's just look at a given span length. Let's take a span length of, I don't know, 30 feet. Okay? So what you're seeing here is this bar that's going anywhere from about, was that 1.5 to what, 3.8, something like that. So what this is saying is that before we adopted LRFD, before we adopted LRFD, our reliability indices, which is our measure of acceptable levels of risk, were all over the place, anywhere from 1.5 to 3.8. Now that's before LRFD. What about after? What is that, from 3.4 to 3.6? The, the, the levels of risk and that uniform level of safety are much more accurately maintained. And I've got to applaud the concrete industry for being ahead of this. In the, steel in, uh, in the steel manual, and for those of you that are in steel design, you'll find that the steel manual actually does both. You have ASD and LRFD. In here, there's just LRFD. We're not, there, there's nothing else that we use. So I've got to applaud the, the concrete industry for being a little ahead of this. <coughs> All right. So what we end up doing in LRFD, because it is a more refined means of design is this. We compute a nominal resistance. In other words, if I were to go down to the lab and, and load this table until failure, its nominal resistance is how much force would cause this thing to fail. But we then adjust that nominal resistance by these special resistance factors. And resistance factors are based on behavior and on acceptable levels of risk. To obtain, so we have a nominal resistance, we multiply it by a resistance factor to obtain a factored resistance we can use for design. 
We do the same thing for loads, but we, it's not as simple as just taking the loads and multiplying them by two or multiplying them by whatever. We take the loads and we handle them separately. The, the reason why is because different loads have different levels of uncertainty associated with it. I mean, let's be honest. Let's take this, this building, okay? If I were to look at, let's say, the, uh, the, the floor system in this building, let's say this floor system above us, what do we have? We got drop ceiling, then there's, you know, all the, the lighting, maybe you know, some duct allowance, we've got the beams themselves, the, the formwork, the concrete slab, the carpet. I mean, with enough time and all of the appropriate data, you all should be able to calculate the load of this floor pretty easily. And it's just densities and volumes, all right? You all can do that. You've been able to do that since high school. Now, that's the dead load. Do you think that you have a better understanding of the dead loads on this building as opposed to the live loads? I mean, shouldn't there be more uncertainty associated with the live load? I mean, how much load is in this room right now? How many people are in here? How many people are going to be here in here an hour from now? Do you know? A little more uncertain about that, aren't we? So because of that, we factor the loads differently. For instance, a very common load combination that we will use is 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. We up the live load by 60%, whereas we're only upping the dead load by 20%. It's because we're less certain about the live load. Does that make sense? All right. <coughs> so this equation that you see here, I know it looks messy. It's not bad. Ultimately, this is what we're going to spend the main majority of our semester focused with. And all it means is that our factored resistances must be greater than or equal to our factored loads. And that is how we size elements in this course. That's how we determine that we need a concrete beam that's 18 inches by 30 inches and we need four number seven rebar in it or, or whatever. That, that's how we determine that. Okay. <coughs> so is everybody good? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Now, one thing that, that I, I want to cover, you know, and, and I'm, uh, this is essentially the topic I'm covering common to both classes, is the concept of the loads. You know, the, the difference between taking a course in steel design and taking a course in concrete design, honestly, is the resistances. You're spending a whole semester learning how do you compute the resistance of a reinforced concrete beam. How do you compute the resistance of a steel column? That's the difference between the two classes. But loads are loads, and, and they're very common. So I want to take a little bit of time to cover that. And, and more so, I want to take some time and cover the, uh, I guess, the connection, if you will, between what we're doing now and what you all did last semester when you took me for structural analysis. Now, I want to make it clear we are not going to do any super complex structural analysis in this class. I will not give you a beam with three hinges and, and you know, six different distributed loads. You all have already proven to me that you can do that. You did it last semester. We are not doing that stuff this semester. I am not saying that you're uh, not going to do any structural analysis at all, but the structural analysis we do in here is very basic. Plus, I gave you that guide to help, help yourself out with the, the basic stuff. Everybody good? Okay. So before we actually get into the nitty gritty behind what makes given loads, you know, what they are, we have to learn, you know, how to distribute them. I mean, when you look up, let's say, a, a floor load in a building for live load, you might get 40 PSF, 50 PSF. Like the ground snow load in Huntington, West Virginia is 20 PSF. There are, a lot of them are... are uh, uh, defined as pressure loads. So how do you take this 20 pounds per square foot, how do you take that and actually turn it into something that we can analyze, a beam with loads on it and, and hinges and rollers and so that we can get shear diagrams and moment diagrams. How do you turn that code specified value into an appropriate structural analysis model? How do you do that? It's with an understanding of tributary area. Now, what is tributary area? Tributary area is a measure of, for if we're looking at a given element, how much of that given floor that element is responsible for. Let, let's take an example. Let's say, you know, above us we've got some beams supporting this floor system above us, right? 
So let's say here's the floor system. I got a beam, I don't know, about right there, a beam about right there, and a beam right there. Fair statement? So let's say I'm looking at, at this beam. I am, I am positing to you that this beam is responsible for all the area it is supporting halfway over to the next one, halfway over to the next one. Beyond that, the other beam takes over. Does that make sense? That is tributary area. That's how we distribute these pressure loads into acceptable loads that we can use for structural analysis. Now, I want to demonstrate that to you all with a quick example. So we're going to look at a floor plan. We're going to assume that that floor is being subjected to a pressure load of 20 pounds per square foot. Okay? We're going to see how that load is distributed. So here's my floor plan. Before we begin, I want to make sure we all understand the picture that we're looking at. So what we're looking at is imagine I'm in a helicopter and I'm looking at a building like this. Okay? So if that's the case, what do you think these little H's, what do they represent? The columns. See, he, he's cheating because he was here last time. Now, those H shapes typically, they would be more representative of a steel column, but it really doesn't matter for this stuff whether the, it's steel, concrete, popsicle sticks. It really doesn't matter. The behavior is the behavior. So does everybody see that we're look what these little eight shapes, they're, they're the columns that we're looking at the building like this. Okay? So these, what are these? They're the beams, right? Make sense? Okay? See these bays right here where we have bracing indicated? Now keep in mind, we're looking at the building like this. Those bracing elements are if we push on the building. And there are two load events that tend to do that, that load a building laterally. One of them is wind. What do you think the other one is? Wind blows on a building like that. What's the other load that would load a building like this? That would load a building like this? Earthquake. There we go. An earthquake. Are you cheating? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Earthquakes. Actually, actually, um, Earthquakes really don't load a building. There's not some earthquake monster that stands up and pushes on a building. But what they do do to a building is accelerate a building. It's like if you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in a car and let's say Lee's driving and you're in the passenger seat. And <laughs> See, Tony already knows where I'm going with this. So you're driving down the road and then Lee hits the brakes. What happens to you? You go for it. What do you hit? Thank you that somebody said seat belt, you know. Hopefully you all are wearing your seat belts. But think, you applied load to that seat belt, but the only reason you did it is because you have a mass and were put through a change of acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. Remember that whole Newton's second law thing? That's what that's how you do earthquake design essentially. You find the accelerations in a given region based on where you're at in the country. You calculate the mass of the building. Force equals mass times acceleration gives you your base shear. Then it's all about just distributing those loads to each given floor and running a, a RISA model. That's basically it. So. <coughs> all right. So going back to the floor frame, those what you saw before, those were the, the you know, or just an image of the, the frame. These are tributary areas of selected elements in that frame. So if I'm looking here on the bottom left, just a floor beam, it doesn't matter if I'm looking at this floor beam or that one or that one, it, it doesn't matter. I'm proposing to you that that floor beam is responsible for halfway over to the next beam and, and the same on the other side. Make sense? That is that floor beam's tributary area. If I look at this element, I'm going to call this a girder. I call it a girder because there are beams framing into it. So like these beams are connecting into that girder. I, that's how I call, uh, term those. <coughs> that girder, its tributary width is a little wider, but it's the same deal. Halfway to the next one. 
halfway to the next one. What about the column? Halfway over to the next one, halfway over to the next one, halfway up, halfway down. Make sense? So, this is the tributary area of this beam. What is its tributary width? In other words, how wide is that? Can you tell me what that is? It's 10 feet. Because each of these beams are spaced 10 foot on center, right? So from here to that beam, here to that beam is 10 feet. So it's 5 feet over, 5 feet over, 10 feet. Not too bad, right? So if I'm looking at an individual floor beam, I propose to you that its tributary width is 10 feet. Now, again, I have a steel beam here, you know, uh, rendered. It doesn't matter if it's a steel beam, concrete beam. This distribution is the same. Okay. Everybody all right with that? Everybody okay with calculating tributary width? Okay. Now, here's how we use it, okay? That, okay, keep in mind, our floor for this example is being subjected to 20 pounds per square foot. What I'm saying is that if I have this pressure load, this 20 pounds per square foot, and it is applied over a distance of 10 feet, I'm saying this 20 pounds per square foot over a width of 10 feet is essentially 200 pounds per foot. Does that make sense? And if I have a distributed load on a beam, well, then I can do something like that, right? Now, if you can't do that, after having me for structural analysis, then I utterly failed as, as a structural analysis professor. I have got to believe you can do that problem, right? But that's the point of what I'm trying to, to, to make with this. We are taking a, a frame and a code-specified load and using some very basic assumptions, turning that into a model that we can use from a structural analysis standpoint. This is something you can be able to do, or you should be able to do. Am I right? Everybody all right with this? So can you compute those reactions? Can you do that? Any problems with that at all? Going once. Going twice. Okay, good. All right. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, now, I want to take some time then, and now that we've looked at a beam, I want to look at a girder, okay? And it's a little different because I've got beams framing into that girder. Do you see what I mean? Like if I look at an individual girder, like let's say this point, this is a very special point on the girder because there's a beam framing in here, there's a beam framing in there, right? Now, let's go back to this. What are the support reactions on this beam, what are they, 2,500 pounds? They have, that 2,500 pounds has to go somewhere, right? I mean, if I look at, let's say, this floor beam, what you're telling me then is I've got 2,500 pounds on this end of the beam, 2,500 pounds on this end of the beam. See that? It's got to go somewhere, right? So I propose to you that there are, for, when you're looking at elements like this, there's really two different ways you can go about it. One of them is to say, you know what, just treat that girder the same way we were treating those beams. Just treat it as one big distributed load. And that's method number two. Just you, do it the same as you did before. The first method, however, is to take those reactions and distribute them as point loads. <coughs> now, let's go back to this, this beam. All right? <coughs> let's see if we can idealize this in our heads. This is my beam. How long is that beam going to be? 50 feet, right? How many point loads are going to be on that beam? Well, well, okay. I see what you're getting at. But they're really only going to be one, two, three, at four locations. A point load here, a point load here, point load here, point load here. Now, each of those point loads, how much are they going to be? If the reaction on each of those individual beams was 2,500 pounds, how much is the point load going to be? 5,000, because if we're looking at the frame, and again, steel frame, it doesn't matter if it's steel or concrete or whatever, but if we're looking at that beam, there's one framing in here, one framing in there. So we're getting reactions from either side. 
So our analysis model actually looks something like that. It's a series of point loads. 5,000 pounds, not 2,500. Does that make sense? That's an important point to, to, to make. Now, let me, let's, let's see if you're paying attention. Okay, that's for C2, D2, okay? Now, let's say we were looking at C4, D4. What would the point loads be? 2,500, because that's this element right here on the bottom. And there are not two beams framing into it. There's only one. There, 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 and there. One on either side, not two. Does that make sense? So it's just making sure that you recognize what's going on. All right. If you've got this problem, a series of point loads, I've got to believe that you can do that. The shear diagram and the moment diagram. What's the shear diagram look like? They're point loads. It's just constant values. Looks like one big stair step. Constant shear diagram is indicative of a linear moment diagram, right? Everybody good? Now that is one way to do the girder. The other way of doing the girder is that. Just say it's 20 pounds per square foot over that width of 25 feet. It gives you 500 pounds per foot. The girder's 50 foot long and just treat it like that. You do that, you're going to get the same type of result that you did before. Okay, so method number one, distribute the point loads. Method number two, use the distributed load. How do they compare against one another? That's what they look like. So this is taking those plots and actually plotting them on top of one another. Okay, now you look at the moment diagram there, <laughs> there isn't hardly much difference at all, right? It really doesn't matter that much, does it? Okay, what about the shear? Eh, there's a little bit of difference. But I guess the, the more important question to ask is, you know, we had, what, four beams framing into that girder? What if it was eight beams framing into that girder? What do you think? Would these two methods get closer together or farther apart, like in terms of their accuracy? They'd be close. I mean, yeah, if I had a whole bunch of beams framing into that girder, it'd be, it'd be almost identical, right? Now, we had four beams framing into that, into that girder, what if it was just one beam framing into that girder? It'd be really far apart, wouldn't it? It wouldn't even be the same story, would it? it it's so different that it's, it, they're, they're not even the same story. So, <coughs> I propose to you the following rule of thumb. It's not, um, it, it's not uh, anything magical or anything you know, super accurate. My thought is if, if there are anything less than, if there's less than five interior beams, use the method of point loads. Anything more, just distributed load. Sound good? Okay. Now, the final point to look at is these interior columns. Okay? So, there's actually two different ways to do the interior columns as well, but if you do it right, you get the same answer. Okay? Now, the first method is to just, you know, the simple way. I've got a pressure load. I have an area. That pressure load times the area will give me a single point load on that column. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to say, well, if I look at, oh, if I look at one of these columns, I say, well, okay, let's just take this. I've got one, one I've got two girders framing into that column, right? I've also got these two elements here, and yeah, they're, they're drawn with bold lines, but in the end, they're just floor beams, right? Just individual floor beams by themselves, right? So, I could look at this problem from two different lights. I could say, well, one way of looking at it is the area times the pressure. The area being halfway over, halfway over, 50 times 25. Pressure is 20, uh, 20 pounds per square foot. That gives me about 25 kips. Another way of looking at it and saying, well, those little, those individual beams had reactions of 2,500 pounds. Those big girders had reactions of 10,000 pounds. Let's see. Two girders frame in, two beams frame in, two of these and two of these add them up. Oh, I've got a typo. That's supposed to be a two there. Whoops. Let's see. That is supposed, let's see. You might want to write that in. That's supposed to be a two. Oops. 
I'm a lot of mistake every now and then. Everybody got that? Okay. My little pen thing will go away. Okay. I'll fix that on the slides after class. Okay. Another way of looking at it is saying I got two beams and two girders framing into that. That'll give me a total supported load of 25 kips. In the end, the two methods are the same. Is everybody all right with that? Okay. Now, the final point I want to make is that's all for just one floor. This is a building. A building could have multiple floors. Okay. So if I've got, let's say, a three-story building, or three floor, three loaded floors, let's just say, um, the very top has 25,000 pounds. So this section of the column has 25,000 pounds in compression, right? Go down another floor, now we've got another 25,000 pounds. So think statics, right? Cut a section, look up, i got 50,000 pounds going down, 50,000 pounds going up, 50,000 pounds in compression, right? One floor down, 75,000 pounds in compression, Re our floor reaction being 75,000 pounds, and that's what the geotech engineers need, right? Not too shabby, right? And too bad. Does anybody have any questions? This is an important concept. I want to make sure you all understand this. I wish we had a little more time last semester. I probably would have thrown it in there, but I think it made also a little bit of sense to throw it in here as well. Everybody good? Okay. Now, going back to what I said earlier, when you open up a document that specifies loads, it tends to specify those loads in pounds per square foot or, or ultimately or things like that. Now, what I want to do is review what those loads are and where they come from. Now, we tend to classify loads in a number of different categories. In the world of structural engineering, particularly building design, there's really only five loads you need to consider. You've got gravity loads like dead load and live load and then snow load and then your lateral loads the one that push to the side wind and earthquakes so one question to ask is where do i find these loads i mean i mentioned earlier you know the ground snow load in west virginia or in huntington west virginia is 20 pounds per square foot where'd you come up with that you just make that up no i didn't make that up <laughs> that ultimately comes from a document uh, called ASCE 7. Now, we're not going to use ASCE 7 directly, but what I'm going to do is review what I think are the critical components for this course. Um, we would go way more in-depth if we were actually doing uh, an advanced reinforced concrete design class where we design, you know, larger scale elements and looked at stability and things like that. But for the purposes of this course, I just want you to be aware that it exists and, and understand some of the, the critical, important parameters associated with, uh, with what's inside it. Um, <laughs> another point I'll mention, you, you might hear about this in your careers or later on, hear about IBC, the International Building Code. Yeah, there's some important stuff in there. Um, a lot of the stuff that they adopt, though, just comes directly from ASC 7. It's funny how the last edition of ASC 7 was published in 2010, and this was published in 2012. Basically, they opened up ASC 7, it looks pretty good, and then adopted it. So, <coughs> just some food for thought. Okay, now I have a typo on this slide. I noticed it last up uh, uh, in, in steel design, and I didn't have time to correct it. Um, I apologize about that. This is supposed to be 150. No, it's not. You're lying. <laughs> That's supposed to be 150. Okay. Everybody got that? Okay. So, get started. Okay. So, to begin, um, I want to start talking about the simplest load, which is dead load. 
every single structure in existence is in some way or another subjected to dead load. If I talk about beams, what load must all beams be able to withstand? Their own self-weight, okay? So self-weight is a definition of dead load because it's permanent, it's stationary, it's always there, okay? It's what dead load is. Now, the two most common building materials that we use are steel and reinforced concrete. Steel, the definition for its weight is 490 pounds per cubic foot and reinforced concrete, a good estimate for normal weight reinforced concrete is 150 pounds per foot. Um, <coughs> that might vary a little bit depending on the, the material that you use, but for a load estimation standpoint, it's a pretty good value. These are some other common floor dead load values that you might see, um, like if you're looking at, let's say, floor finishes. How much does ceramic tile weigh? How much does suspended ceiling weigh? How much does mechanical or electrical duct allowance? How much does, uh, you know, rigid insulation weigh? Things like that. You open up ASC 7, it's just tables and tables of this stuff. So, if you're looking for dead loads in a building, let's say like this, one way of finding that out is simply to, you know, look it up in something like ASC 7. Another potential possibility is to just call the manufacturer. If you're designing this building, you want to know how much this carpet weighs, just call the manufacturer and ask them. They better know. Or they better have somebody there who will know. Usually that stuff is listed in catalogs anyways. Everybody all right with that? Okay. Now. That's dead load, and there's really, there's, there's just not a whole lot that can be said about dead load. It just is what it is. It's just calculating self-weight, and there's no magic formula to it because it's just, you know, densities and volumes. Um, live loads, however, take a little bit of discussion. Live loads are related to occupancy. In other words, do you really think that the live load that would be associated with a school, is, is a school like this building, would it be used in the same fashion as, say, a stadium would be used? Now, stadiums are going to see much different loads than a university engineering building, right? Different loads than a hospital or a government facility or an office building. That's what live loads are. They represent the occupancy, what the building is used for. We, in this room right now, are a live load being applied to a floor. That's what we are doing. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now, you can look these values up. Uh, these are just some very typical ones. Um, for instance, uh, if we're looking at uh, schools, okay, classrooms. Classrooms are 40 pounds per square foot. Um, corridors above the first floor, 80 pounds per square foot. Does that make sense? Does it make sense that the hallways are designed for heavier loads? Yeah, they're more densely loaded, you know, at, at given times. All right. <laughs> now, one thing I'll point out is these loads are, are, are kind of like, um, how can I put this? Have y'all ever heard of the term uh, like a 100-year flood? Have y'all ever heard of that? The worst flood that you would, the worst expected flood that you would see within a, uh, a given period of time. Now those are sort of maximum occurred events. That, that's what a lot of these loads are, are, are maximum uh, occurred events. There are ways that we can handle that though, and, and the way that we can handle that is through the use of a tool called live load reduction. Now um, before I get into that though, let me, let me back up to, to explain this a little bit. I know when I was taking this course, you know, I saw these occupancy loads and I see, you know, well, a school or a classroom's 40 pounds per square foot. I don't understand what 40 pounds per square foot means. So these are some images that came out of the LRFD guide for pedestrian bridge design. And in the commentary, they threw these images to kind of explain what some of these pedestrian live loads look like. So this is what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. Oh, okay. You can learn about reinforced concrete design if you'd like. I don't know. All right. Um, 
So this is what um, uh, 50 pounds per square foot looks like. They got this square. It's about six foot by six foot. And there's about 12 people in that square. Now that's 50 pounds per square foot. This is 100 pounds per square foot. That's what 150 pounds per square foot looks like. That's a lot of people, right? Now, I did the math in, in a room like this, and I have here 100 a, a people. I think it was a little higher. But if you use those images as a, as a rubric to assess this room, and you say this is a classroom, so that's 40 pounds per square foot, that would mean that for this room to be loaded to its maximum uh, capacity, it would need about 100 people in here. What are the chances that this room will have 100 people in here all day, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And, and Lee's answer was, you're not that popular, Dr. Michelson. And that hurt, hurt me a little bit right here. But he's right. The, the, it's not likely. Okay, We can reduce those loads a little bit to account for the, the probability that, that they're not going to see that full loading all the time. And so we perform a technique called live load reduction. Now, before I pull this slide up, a couple points, or a, a big point I will make is in this class, we deal with real world issues. And in the real world, things are a little more complicated than what we can derive in mechanics of deformable bodies or structural analysis. And um, I know that um, there are a lot of students who are, you know, they want to make sure the math makes sense. You know, I, I derived it, I plug these units in, I should get this value. That's what the, that's what the, the theory, the calculus, all that stuff said. And then you get in here, and I start showing you these empirical equations, you know, how we'll take the square root of PSI and get PSI, and the units, you know, don't match. You go, what the heck is going on? Okay. In this class, we make a, a distinction between mechanistic equations, which is what I can derive. I can use mechanics and materials. I can use calculus, diffie cues, and all that, actually derive an answer. I make a difference between those types of equations and what I'll call empirical equations, empirical relationships. What's an empirical relationship? I go out and I conduct an experiment. I collect data. I try and define some problem that's really complicated and see if I can, you know, take this really complicated problem and simplify it as much as possible. So engineers and researchers have done that on a lot of problems. One problem is how do you account for the, poss or the, the probability that that live load will be reduced. How do you map that to an equation? And this is the answer. This is ASCE7's expression for live load reduction. Okay? So there are some rules associated with it that we'll talk about next time. But I mean, you're taking a square root of you know, feet squared, and there's no units in here. And it's funny how the answer gives you PSF. And I know that. Some students are like, oh, the units don't make any sense. It's an empirical relationship. And we will see a number of those in this class. It's just something I want you to be made aware of. Okay? So it's just, you, know, you want to make sure you're paying attention to stuff like that. I'm going to stop it here. Next time we're going to pick it up on live load reduction and, and continue our discussion with that. That's all I got for you all. I will see you all on Friday.